Hi everyone, this is Laura from Watch Laura So, and today we are going to try to make a feather. I'm really excited. We're just going to do a basic feather. There is, we're not going to do anything fancy on it. I'm going to show you a couple ways of doing it. There really are a few ways, and I think, here's my theory. I'm going to tell you my theory and what works for me. It depends on what machine I use as to what method I use on making a feather. And I will tell you why. Some of the uh, sewing machines actually have quite a bit of mechanism down in this quilting area. And so where, so it's harder to see past it. Okay, so one thing I wanted to show you is the difference between the two machines. This is my Viking. And so when I have something back here that I need to quilt, this area here, I have a bar coming down here, I have the foot coming down here, and it actually, when, the, it, when you are quilting, it's a lot to look around to see where you're going behind here. This area in here, you can see my pen tip. I can't see that right there. And even over here, it's hard to see if I was out here, where am I going? What direction I'm going to? And if my fabric is back here, then I may not be able to see exactly where I'm going. So a lot of times I will approach it a little bit differently because of this area on my sewing machine. This is my Juki TL18. And when I am quilting on the TL18, I have a lot more visibility. Let's go ahead and put this down. And the only, when I'm quilting, the only place that really is uh, where I can't see is right back here behind this. It doesn't affect me as much and I don't know how to describe it. I, I have all of this visibility. I have this visibility in here. I have this visibility over here. So that's really pretty nice. So on this machine, I can do a lot more because I can see a lot more. Whereas on the Topaz 30, I can't see as much. So I have to approach it a little bit differently. So that's why I think depending on your machine and what you're working with, you may have to try different approaches to see what will work. When you're doing feathers, you really wanna see as much as you possibly can so that you can backtrack over the part of the feather that you need to backtrack on. I find that on the domestic computerized machine that I have, it's easier to do it one method, and on the Juki, it's easier to do it a second method. So I think that sometimes it depends on your visibility and how much you can see. That's my theory. We're gonna get started. I'm gonna show you a, a few different ways of doing it. And I will see you at the sewing machine. We are going to be doing feathers on a straight line. Next time we'll do feathers on a curve, but this time we're doing feathers on a straight line. We're going to do it two ways. The first way is I'm going to come up here and go down just like a plume, come up and go down again, just like we were doing on double plumes. And I'm gonna do that for the whole feather. The, the second way, we're gonna come up and down, then we're gonna come back around and we're gonna bump out and come down again. So they both make beautiful feathers on a straight line. I use this first method on my computerized machine because I I do not have as much visibility as I do in the Juki. The Juki have a lot better visibility than I do on the Viking. And so because of that, I tend to use this first one on my Viking. If I could use the other method on the Viking, I would, but it just usually doesn't come out very well. 
I'm sorry my hand is on this side. I'm trying to keep it far enough away and yet have control so that you can see this area. So because it's feathers and it's going to be going out, I'm going to have to, um, I can't zero the camera in a little bit closer because you wouldn't see the whole thing. All right, so here we go. Hopefully this will work with my hands here. All right, so I have my stitch length to zero. I have my feed dogs down. I have my quilting foot open, uh, quilting foot on. I use an open toe. I'm using glide thread. I have cotton uh, sandwich, which has uh, cotton on the top and uh, batting in between and then cotton on the bottom. And so we're going to go ahead and we're kind of simulating what a quilt would look like. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go up and do my plume just like we've been doing. And actually on straight feathers for this method, I work both of them the same on both sides. They don't look exactly the same. I mean, you, the better you get, the better it looks, but sometimes even then, it, they, they don't always look perfect. And that's okay because birds, birds feathers aren't always perfect either. So we're gonna go up here and we're gonna go out and we're gonna come back down in between. And we're gonna to go to the other side and we're gonna do the same thing. And we're gonna come back down in between. This is no different than double plumes, right? Except double plumes, we tend to put this one a lot bigger. We're gonna build upon that and we're gonna make them a little bit bigger, but they are as big as you want to make them. That's the beauty. So we're gonna come back down in between. And I do this on the Viking this way because I can see the seam. Now there is an inherent problem with this and I'll show you as we finish up. So I'm gonna try and, I try to keep them as even as possible, but I'm not perfect. So we're just gonna go up the stem a little bit and then we'll veer off. I try to keep the angle about the same. And that one just got a little bit bigger than the other one. To do that, I'm gonna go back up. All right, and we're gonna come back down. Ah, I should have brought that over a little bit further. So I would have had I done this right, I would have brought this over just a little bit further, just in there. I have this separating there. Just right in here. Okay, it's just a little bit of a change, but I would have done that uh, a little bit, but I would have tried to do it a little bit better on that. Because you want it to come across as like a nice rounded end of a flume for this design. There's actually designs where you don't do that. But on this one, All right, we're gonna go out here. Okay. We're gonna come down here and then we're gonna go up here and we're actually gonna make a top plume just like this. And 
you know, it can look however you want it to look. So one of the problems you can see right away, I think, is that on this method, you are going to get heavier spine. If that's okay with you, then that, that you know, that may not bother you. But it is a heavier spine. It will flatten the area a lot more. Uh, that can be used in some ways in the benefit, and sometimes it can be used that you don't want this as heavy. We are going to modify this design a little bit um, in a couple videos where I can show you how I try to minimize this area by changing the design slightly. So, but the, I mean, this method, we start with just a base. I always start with the same base, uh, no matter what method. I just start with a small one. It just kind of gets me going. And then the next one was here. Let me move this. So that we have the first one here. I always start with these first small ones. And then I have a second one come up here and then follow this line down and then come up and go up here and follow the line down and come up, go down here and follow the, the line down. This method I use on machines where I can't see, uh, I can't see to backtrack backwards as easily. So by doing this method, you keep it in front of you all the time. So you're always, when you're going up and you can't see as well, it's kind of a open area, come back around. When you have to go over on previous stitches, you can see the whole way and you're more likely to be able to do that than to veer off. And I certainly had a, a place where I veered off right there. I, I'm not... I usually don't like to see as heavy of a spine. I certainly have plenty of quilts that have this kind of spine because I had the Viking before I had this Juki. With the Juki and with anything that has kind of a narrow area in here where you can see a lot better or if the foot is angled a little bit, you might be able to do this uh, you'll be able to do this second method. So this method does it a little bit differently. I'll still start with the two kind of starter plumes. Okay, they're just starter plumes. And I like to start with them because it kind of gives me a base to work with. Uh, there are a couple designs where you wouldn't want that, but almost everything you can do it. I'm going to start again, again, stitch length zero, feed dogs are down, and I'm going to go out here and start with my starter plumes. All right, now for this next one, it kind of works in uh, twos. So I will go and I will make my next bloom. Just like that. Now I'm going to backtrack. Over the plume and this is where it's important to see where you're going. So I actually backtracked from here to here. Now I'm going to go out and make another plume and bring it down, but I'm not actually bringing it all the way down. And by doing that, I won't actually have a complete spine out here, but it will look and appear that way. So it reduces the amount of bolt, uh, threads in that area. All right. Now I'm going to go do the other side. You certainly could work one side of the feather. You can make these plumes you can make them really as long or short as you want. 
you can make them curve more or go straight. So there's lots of opportunities, even on a straight line, to make amazing feathers that have so much definition. And different people can have different ideas. All right. So this one I wanted to take and make a little bit lar larger. And I'm going to backtrack over this end right here to about there. Now I'm going to come out and I'm going to come back around. And I come down about that far. I'm going to go and do the other side. And I didn't come out as far on that. Sometimes you don't intend to, especially if you're limited on space in that area. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and do it uh, two more times, two more plumes on each side, and then I'll do a top. So there's my feather. In general, I was trying to make it a little bit larger and then come back. Uh, if I could have done it again, I would have brought this all the way over here, but that also works. There are big spaces where I did not actually come down for the spine, and yet there looks like there's a definite spine in that area, or a, at least the feel of a spine. This would produce a little bit softer feather than you would have over here. This would be a little stiffer, uh, but both of them would be beautiful. So depending on what your visibility is or what you want to try doing, because sometimes people feel very comfortable going backwards without seeing a lot of what they're doing, and they simply have a good spatial concept, and so they're able to do that. So that may be you, and, and if it is, then this method would work very nice. That was so much fun to make feathers, and I hope that by showing you the couple different methods of doing feathers, that one of them works for you, and if not, um, those are the ones that I tend to use, and there are other people out there that have other ways of doing feathers, so certainly take a look at everybody's methods because you will find what works for you. And that's the most important thing is just finding something that works for you. And so I hope that you enjoyed me sharing how I do feathers and how I approach them uh, on different projects. And so we will continue a little bit more on feathers. I want to show you a couple of things that I do with feathers to make it more interesting. So thank you so much for stopping by and watching my video on how I do feathers. I hope that it was helpful and I hope that you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time at the sewing machine. Bye bye.